I'm Amanda Locker. I am a co-founder of Mind Minds and Mind Minds Foundation, where we teach out-of-work coal miners in Pennsylvania and West Virginia how to write software, and then we employ them to do so. And so at Mind Minds, we value the ability to write software over the ability to recite vocabulary. So you might be thinking, what in the world is Amanda doing on stage talking about a vocabulary lesson? Um, that doesn't make a lot of sense for somebody who, who's fairly pragmatic and wants to put code into production. Well, what we find in teaching people to, to write software is that often we're just teaching them to Google effectively and efficiently. We're teaching them to be able to read blogs and papers and Stack Overflow posts. And so what we've also found is that if you find a result to a question that has vocabulary that you've never read before, especially if there's lots of it and it's repeating, it can feel like you're constantly stuck in a rabbit hole, and so you just discard those things. And so I'm hoping that today I can give you some terminology, some vocabulary for design patterns that will help you to read more of those blogs and read a little bit deeper and determine can some of those things apply to my problems. So we're really lucky. We work in an industry that is really, really young. You are writing history. Every day when you write code, you are developing the industry. We are not medicine. We are not mathematics. Nothing has been written in stone yet. Um, so we're constantly trying to find analogies with other industries that will help us to figure out how our industry relates to others and how we can write really good code. And so just as an example, I married a person who used to be a chemist. And so we'd have conversations, and, and he actually is now a software developer, and he looks at the stuff that he did in chemistry and says, how does this relate to software, and can I take things that I've learned in the past and apply some close approximation to something that I'm doing in software? And he does it all the time. We also do it all the time with manufacturing. You'll hear lots of talks about lean manufacturing, lean Kanban. A lot of the words that we use in manufacturing, we now use in software. Some close approximation close approximation of an analogy that we learned in another industry, we apply here. Same thing with mathematics. A lot of mathematicians find an applied approach in software development. And so you read a lot of papers from mathematicians who have done a lot of really important things in software. And so a lot of the design patterns that we'll talk about today come from mathematics. So design patterns. What is a design pattern? This is Wikipedia's description of what is a design pattern. But I like to add on to it. Design patterns should be inventable by developers. If you've written code for any length of time and seen the same problem over and over again, and you're able to apply some, um, you're recognizing some pattern that you can apply an interface to and give a name, then you, have, um, you should be able to create a pattern. And patterns should be something that you can develop from first principles. Patterns shouldn't have to come out of the sky. They're coming from things that you already know, recognizing, and then giving a name to. And so functional programming tends to get a bad reputation because there are people who are advocates who will tell you, hey, it's all easy. This is all really easy stuff. Um, and, and sometimes it is. But other times, that's just lies, right? Like, we're talking about things that are based on abstractions. As we're talking about abstractions, the, the further down the abstraction tree you go, the more complex it becomes, and the harder it is to keep all of this information in your head. So you find yourself looking up the same words over and over and over again until something clicks and you just get them. So when people are laughing and saying it's all easy and you should just get it, just ignore them. That's not true. One of the first terms that you see when you start reading mathematical papers is intuition. And from what I can gather within functional programming, intuition mostly means you should know this based on something that you've never seen before, based on something you've never done before, and oh my gosh, have you ever even written a line of code? How do you not know this already? I really liked one of the lightning talks earlier where we talked about, hey, let's learn stuff and be nice to people. How about when we learn something, we teach it and we share freely and we're nice to other humans and we expect the best. Um, and so that's what I'm gonna ask from all of you today. If you learn anything from me, please go and, and teach other people and use it nicely. Another word that's used very often is algebra. What is algebra? Algebra is that class that we took in like fourth and fifth grade, maybe a little bit earlier if you were more advanced. Um, Essentially what algebra means in programming is your 
your language, and algebra is your language. It's the thing that you're allowed, the things that you're allowed to do within your language. If you think of it like that, it will help you through the, through the papers. Okay, so let's take a huge step back and completely stop thinking about programs as these files and files of code. Let's start to think about programs as things that have inputs and produce outputs with some sort of translation from A to B. What'd I say? Did I just say a program is a function? Exactly, programs are functions. If you think of programs just as simple functions, then you start to see how they can become composable, they can become things that um, we can abstract over. Okay, so programs are functions, what are functions? Functions take inputs, translate them into outputs. Every input should have an output. So referential transparency. This is a phrase that tells us that every function should have inputs and outputs and no side effects. So side effects are things like, if I have a function that takes an integer and returns a string, it shouldn't also, before returning that string, go off and change a property on an object. That's a side effect, don't do that. That breaks a lot of your abilities that you get, some of the great things that you get with functional programming. So expressions versus statements. Expressions are lines of code that return a result. Statements don't return a result. So in Ruby, we're really lucky, right? Because we're working with expressions. What expressions give us is the ability to do function composition. Okay, function composition seems really straightforward and really easy, but it's something that you start to take for granted as you move along through abstractions. So function composition depends on type signatures. This is where um, functional programming starts to break down for people when we start to talk about type signatures. We teach people, at my minds, we teach people Ruby, but we make them think about type signatures as well, even though they don't have to write them down like they may have to in a Haskell. Because it helps them to become better programmers. It helps them to think about how will you compose. Okay, so here we have our same first function, function one. And here we have function two. Function one takes an int and returns a string. Function two takes a string and returns an array of strings. Okay, straightforward, simple enough. The output from function one is now used as the input for function two. Because there are no side effects, I can compose these reliably. Compose, compose is a function that's built into a lot of languages. It's not built into Ruby. But when people say compose, they mean f of g of x. What? That's mathematics, right? f of g of x. F's a function, G's a function, X is your parameter. So if I can apply F to G to X, um, then I have function composition. Okay, let's step up a level. We've done functions. Everybody's worked with functions in the past. Everybody understands what a function is at this point. Um, now let's talk about containers. Here we've got a bed, a dog, and a table, and they're in a container. That seems kind of messed up, you wouldn't do that in real life, hopefully. But our table in this instance, we're gonna say our, the thing in the table, or the thing in our container is a string. And our container is of type array. I've got an array of strings. We use them all the time. We've got a container of things. So here my, can, my array has strings, here my array has integers, here my array has persons. What are we noticing? My container does not care about the values that are inside of it. What that means is I've got a polymorphic container. My polymorphic container, because I don't care what type is inside of it, I'm just gonna say it's full of A's. My container has A's, an array of A's. Okay, one level of abstraction. Now, a little bit more interesting, it doesn't have to be an array, it could also be a hash. It could also be a maybe. So, my polymorphic container, I don't care about the, what the type of the container is and I don't care what the type of the value is, they're not dependent on each other. So now that I've got these polymorphic containers that have stuff, oh, and I've just introduced maybe, which is a monad, which I'll, if you've heard of monad before, you've probably heard of the maybe because it helps to deal with problems with nil. Um, and maybe is a type of container. So in this instance, maybe has 42 or dog or none. Doesn't matter, still maybe. Still a polymorphic container. Okay, so I've used the word polymorphic a whole bunch of times, and what does it mean? It basically means more abstract. 
I want you to take a step away from the concrete into the abstract, and what that means is it's harder to test. First thing you should be thinking of if we're doing TDD or if we're writing tests at all to try and prove that, or um, help us to have a better understanding of our code and think that our code is correct or more correct or we're doing the right things or what we expected, this is gonna be harder because now not only do I have to test for my ints and my strings and my persons, I have to test for all of them. I have to test for every type, which is very difficult to do. It's hard to write so many tests that you can have any kind of confidence that this is going to go well. So I'll, I'll leave you with the harder to test as, as I'm going through these design patterns, I'm going to talk about a lot of things that you could put into your code, you can go back and put into production, but just know that if you don't write tests to make you feel confident and make your team feel confident, it will go bad. It will go very, very bad. Um, so next thing's next, functors. Functors is another word that people throw around all the time and it means different things to different people. One of the most common misperceptions is that a functor is a function. A functor is not a function, but a functor is an object. The only thing that you should ever have to think about when you think of functor is it's an object that implements the mappable interface. I can map over polymorphic containers that implement the ma mappable interface. Okay, so if you remember nothing else, remember that is what a functor is. It's like an array or a hash, it has mappable. And this is all it means. So um, here's my fmap function. It's a f of a, a function of a to b, and it returns an f of b. Okay, so functors implement mappable and follow two laws. Mathematics people love laws. They like to keep you in line. Um, so our two laws are identity, or I'm sorry, um, are the law of composition and the law of identity. Um, and so let's talk about identity and const. These are two really common functors. As you're reading mathematics papers, you'll start to, to see these over and over again. So identity um, essentially just, re it, it is the value that is within the identity. With any functions that are mapped over it, applied to it. So in our, our top function here, we've got identity and we map a, a method or a function called multiply 10 over identity 42 and it returns identity of 420. An important thing with a functor is it keeps its structure. So we've got identity of 420. We're not just returning 420, we're returning identity of 420, which means that I can't just add it to something else. I can't just do arithmetic with it. It's wrapped in a functor. It's got its container. And then the same thing for const. Const 42, if I map a function over a const, it's still always gonna return to me the exact same value that was in const. So there's a slight difference between const and identity. I can't map functions over a const and get something different. I'm always gonna get the same value that was in the container. Okay, um, and so category. This all comes from a branch of mathematics called category theory. So what's a category? A category is just objects and arrows. Arrows are also called morphisms. Morphisms are also called functions or things you can do. So objects and things they can do. Um, types and functions, programming languages. Okay, so Ruby has procs. Procs are the thing that helped to make Ruby more functional. I met Mots in like 2008 and I asked him, what would you do different if you could do something with, different with Ruby if you're gonna start from scratch? He said, I'd make it more functional. And so we've got these procs. Here we've got four procs, um, pretty straightforward, simple ones. Make S just turns things into strings. Times just produces the product. Concat produces the concatenation, and execute is a little bit more interesting. Execute takes f and x and applies f to x. So f is a proc, so it's a proc that takes a proc. Here are just instances of me calling them, and again, the interesting thing here is execute. If I call execute, passing it the proc make s and the value four, it does nothing more than applies make s to the value four and returns four, just the same as if we would have called it in the first place. Okay, let's talk about type signatures. So, these type signatures are all fairly straightforward. Um, make s takes an int and returns a string. Type signatures. The thing on the right is the thing that it returns. This is where some of these papers get hard, is how do you read 
all these arrows and things that I wasn't used to before I learned this stuff. The thing on the right is the thing that it's returning. Everything to the left is a parameter. There's a concept called currying, which means that you don't have to pass all of the parameters at once. You can pass them any number at a time. But for this, we're gonna presume we're passing them all at the same time. We, get, we have an int arrow string, it takes an int, returns a string. We have int arrow int arrow int, it's taking in two ints, returning an int. We have string arrow string arrow string, same thing. And then again, interesting, with the execute function, we've got parentheses. We've added something new to our type signature language. Parentheses means there's a function. So this execute function takes an int as well as a function that takes an int and returns a string, and it returns a string. Okay. We can talk about these things in more abstract ways. We don't have to know that it's an int, we don't have to know that it's a string, we don't have to know that it's a person, whatever the case. We can talk about them in terms of A's and B's. So here, all I know about A and B is that they may be two different things. So takes an A, returns a B. Takes two A's, returns an A. Takes two A's, returns an A. And then again, a function that takes an A, returns a B, as well as an A, applies that A, to the, applies that function to that A and gives you the return type of B. Okay, I'm gonna remove the duplicated A to A to A because there's no need to talk about it twice and then I'm gonna step up a level of abstraction. I'm gonna talk about polymorphic containers within our type signature. Here I'm doing something that's not very abstract, it's very concrete in fact, it's an array of A's. An array of A's returning a B an array of A, two arrays of A's returning an array of A, and then our bottom one, again, is the most complex. It's got a function that takes an A and returns an array of B. Another parameter is an array of A, and our final output is an array of B. Now we're gonna get that next level of abstraction. We're going to start talking about, I don't care if it's an array or if it's any type of M. So M is just saying there's a polymorphic container here. A polymorphic container of M with an A value returning a B. Um, and then at the bottom, the, the interesting function here is again the M of A function of A to M of B returning in fact an M of B. Did you follow all of that? One level of abstraction added on to the next, added on to the next. Nothing changed except I changed the level of abstraction by changing it to letters instead of concrete instances. Okay, I've been dancing around the word monad. Um, what the heck is a monad? A monad, again, is just a design pattern and it, it has an interface that has two methods, that is all. Remember our functor? Functors had one method, mappable, fmap. Our monad has two methods. One is join and one is return. Let's start with return, we'll start at the bottom because it's always the easiest. All return does is it shoves a value into a monad. That's it. Um, so if I take an A, I'm gonna return an M of A. If I take a number four, I'm gonna return an array with the item four in it. Really straightforward. Okay, to get more complex, our join type signature, an M of M of A returning an M of A. Okay, let's replace M with array and replace A with the number 42. So an array of array of 42 is my input and my output is an array of 42. You guys have seen this all the time. We use this all the time in Ruby, it's just flatten. I think what a lot of people don't put a lot of thought into is that yeah, I can flatten array of arrays, that's easy. You can also flatten any type of any polymorphic container containing other polymorphic containers, as long as it's the same M. Okay, so here's our bind function. This is the other thing that makes monad a monad, and this is when you read mathematical papers or read programming papers, this is the type signature that you most often will see, and it looks very confusing to people. So this should look really, really familiar after we went through our functor, because this is just telling us that it's got mappable, it's got a map. So anything that is a monad is also a functor because it's got the mappable and then those extra two um, join and returns, the extra two interface methods. Okay, so let's find out what I'm talking about here. 
Um, anytime I see a complex type signature, I like to color code it because it helps me to think about what the heck is going on. So here, my signature is M of A, a function that takes an A to an M of B and an M of B. So I put in blue my array of one, two, three. That's my M of A. And then I wrote a quick proc. Um, in this case, I'm just going to call it A to M of B, so it's really easy to determine what it is. And it is, it's going to take in uh, nums, and then it's going to map over my nums the two-string method. And then I will need to return an array of one, two, three. So it's all fairly straightforward. It's really incremental first principle bits that we put together that build upon themselves to become a bigger design pattern. And then, of course, we have to have a flatten. So a maybe of maybe of A's, when you call flatten, you just get a maybe of A. So really straightforward. It's all methods that we've used before. Again, with monads, we've got a couple of laws. We've got associativity, also called the law of composition. If you read it as the law of composition, just think associativity. And then identity. So here is our identity monad. Um, essentially, this is a class where we define identity, and we've got join and return, right? Return is just going to return the value shoved into your monad, right? So we're going to have an identity of a value. And our join, um, it's really just returning the value because it's identity. Identity always means it's going to return the thing that you give it. OK, so we've gotten through monads. Um, now co, everybody, you start talking about monads, everybody starts talking about category theory. The first thing that comes to mind that's kind of in vogue is co. Um, co means reverse the arrows. It's the categorical dual. Okay, so I'm gonna teach you co in regards to two different morph morphisms, and a morphism is a function, um, fold and unfold. Fold is inject, we use it in Ruby pretty often. Um, and unfold does the opposite. It creates a list out of some stuff. So let's first talk about fold. Fold is called a catamorphism. Catamorphism is fold. It's just a fancier name, makes me sound smarter. So the type signature for fold is this. And again, it's like, okay, it's kind of bloated. I don't really know what it's doing. It looks, looks complicated. I use inject all the time, and this looks complicated. So let's start to talk about it in terms of coloration. <laughs> so we've got a function that takes an A and a B and returns an A. And in this case, I've just created a quick accumulator that's going to concatenate um, some words together. It also takes a seed value. And in this case, we're going to have an empty string as our seed value. And then a list of Bs, okay? I've got words, my, my list of strings. And then the return value is just a string. Type signatures aren't hard. So hopefully you agree with me after seeing the presentation. So that is our catamorphism. Um, it takes a seed, a function, and a list, and it returns a thing, inject. Now we have an anamorphism, which is an unfold. It, again, with a complex type signature, if we start to color, color coordinate, we've got a, um, a returning a list. This is the important part. It's going to return a polymorphic container. It's going to return a container of stuff. Um, in this case, we're unfolding over a seed by giving it a function that takes a B and it'll return a maybe a B. Um, and then it also takes the B and return. If we say our one dot class, you guys run this, right? You, you call class on things all the time. One dot class gives us fix num. If we unfold over that and we call the superclass as the function that we pass in, we're going to get fix num integer number um, all the way up to the, to the top basic object. So it gives us a list of that. So unfold, it takes a seed and a function and it returns a list of things. So catamorphism, anamorphism. Two different types of morphisms that are co. Um, if the, the inputs are seed function list versus seed and function, and the outputs are a thing versus a list of things. So you can see how it's expand, reduce. Those are categorical duals and it's called co. So anytime you read the word co, co-algebra, co-monad, co-monoid, co-applicative, they all mean the same thing. Just reverse the arrows in your type signatures. So I mentioned co-monad. So we've talked about monads. We know the three methods that you have to, to implement bind, join, and return. For a co-monad, it's extend, duplicate, and extract. Let's start at the bottom because it's always easier. 
Functional programmers are really smart and they've got a great sense of humor. So they understand that the co of an M is a W. <laughs> so instead of returning the value injected into a monad, instead we're extracting something out. So extract is just what it says it does. A W of A returns an A. Join and duplicate. Join, remember we took our maybe of maybe a value and just gave it a maybe a value or an array of array of ints, just returns an int. Um, duplicate does the opposite. Instead of having an, an array of arrays, we're gonna start with an array of int and we're gonna return an array of array of int. And I'll tell you why, we'll do, why we would do that here in a minute. And then extend is another map function which tells you that a comonad is also a functor. Comonads and monads are both functors. And it's mapping, instead of taking it from something to a monad of something, it's taking it from a monad of something to something. So two different types of comonads. The environment, which is a co-reader monad. Um, if you know the reader monad, you've got this environment and a context. This is just gonna, the environment tells you, I don't care about the value, I care about that thing around it. And stream, this is the interesting one. This is the one that I think most people relate to because streams are something that's kind of posh at the moment. Um, it's a never ending list sequence of, of stuff. Um, when we're working with a stream in a functional way, you need to be able to work with the first item and then work with the next item and then work with the next item. And these are all streams. So we actually need to expand instead of just having one stream of something, we need to have stream of stream of something, if that makes sense. Okay, so monads are all about context. Um, the monad is the context, the comonad is the value. See how we give them these really fancy words and it's actually really much simpler if we don't talk about them in those ways. Okay, so we've talked about monad and comonad, what is a free monad? Essentially a free monad is a DSL. Um, it gives you the ability to describe abstract syntax trees which help you to write a language Essentially, you'll write the language, you'll write the abstract syntax tree, and then you, ha you are free of context. That's what free is. Adding the context comes later with interpreters. The value here is that you can have one abstract syntax tree with multiple interpreters. Never happens in real life, right? That was my first thought. Like, yeah, right, you could do it. I, I wrote DSLs 10 years ago. I told everybody they were gonna do it. They never did it. You're never gonna need it until I heard somebody give a talk about reason that you would wanna do it, and that's if you have this abstract syntax tree, you have this code that you want to execute one way in production and another way in test. And this is really interesting because you may wanna be in production having things like calls to databases, calls to APIs, doing things that I don't actually want to do in test, so I can interpret my abstract syntax tree in a different way so that I can do things that are safe for testing. Think of free monads as programs. They should be composable, they are programs. Programs are functions, we're back to first principles. Fairly straightforward. Okay, and then the last thing that I wanna talk to you about is Lens. Lens is another really um, popular thing at the moment. Um, essentially, it's a complex way to define a pattern that was needed in functional programming languages Stepping back, we've all heard that design patterns are created because of problems in languages, right? So if we've got a design pattern in a functional language, does that mean there was a problem there? Wait a minute, nothing is ever bad about functional languages. <laughs> um, but actually, the ability to get and set a value in a nested structure, not that straightforward in like a Haskell. There's a lot of boilerplate code that goes with that and a lot that you have to keep in your head in order to be able to do it. Um, so let's just talk about getters and setters. So if I've got a nested structure like this one, um, where I've got a, a fubu, foobar baz with a value of one, Ruby gives me dig, it's really easy, I just dig in, it's um, declarative, it's simple, I know how to do this. But I said a lens is a getter and a setter. So if lenses are getters and setters, here's a, here's a nested object that you can look at that is users that have IDs and names and addresses, and addresses are of course their own object that also have streets and zips. So I have three different um, users here. Notice that my third user doesn't have any addresses. If I wanna give my user an address in Ruby, I just set the value, right? I have to do this map, um, and I do an if, and I say, okay, if my user ID is three, go ahead and set the address to that. Pretty straightforward, it's easy. It's mutable, which isn't great. 
It's imperative, which, you know, people complain about. Um, but it's, really, it's not that hard. It's pretty straightforward. Um, so to look at it in a different way, in JavaScript, um, the, in Ronda Lens, they have duplicated what Ed, Med di Ed Met did in Haskell with lenses, and they created something that is a close approximation. Um, and I'll say close approximation because across languages, there are different rules in the languages that don't allow certain things to be true. Um, so close approximation, Close approximation. Um, our first chunk of code is just a reminder of what our data object looked like. Our second chunk of code is we're going to define a lens by composing two lenses, the first address and the first street. So the first street of the first address is we're calling that first street. And then if we view over our users, if we pass our users into that, it's going to return to us 92 Oak Street. Okay, no big deal, cool. Not a lot of boilerplate, pretty declarative. Um, and then I think more interestingly, our zip codes, our last chunk of code, we're composing, mapping over the addresses, mapping over the zip codes. So for all addresses, all zip codes, we're going to map, over, map that over our users and we're gonna reverse all the zip codes for our users. The return of this is the entire data structure with those things flipped. And this is really nice because you don't lose the context of the things that were above and below it. So you can think about how that's annoying when you have to do some editing of JSON and you're trying to be immutable. You can think about how just returning part of it is not very convenient. So this is immutable and it's declarative, so it's quite nice. So to wrap up, I've given you lots of vocabulary words. Some of them I'm sure you've heard before. Some of them maybe you haven't heard or you didn't really know what they meant. Hopefully now you have some understanding of these are just design patterns. We're just following specific interfaces. The way these things came about were because this pattern existed in code over and over and over again. Somebody gave it a name, created an interface. And then the fact that we're using these interfaces, the fact that we're creating these functors, um, monads, all of these things means that we can write functions around those. I can do things with groups of things. So it's just, it gives you that next level of abstraction. Something else that I hope that you take away is that it's worth exploring some of these papers that you read that some of the words they may seem foreign, but you know, dig in, try and go down the rabbit hole a little bit, but don't implement them into production right away unless you feel confident that you know also how to test them. If your language doesn't have a type checker, it can be really difficult. So make sure that you've built up a testing strategy with your team as well. Um, and that's it. I'm Amanda Locker with Mind Minds, and I thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you.